does one race or nationality produce more criminals than another? Here are answers to questions about criminality. In this session of our series, Dr. Kelly will study the relationship of race and national origin to criminality. He calls the study the ethnological criminal. White. Irish extraction. White. Mexican. White. Irish Scotch. Negro. White. Italian descent. White. Spanish American. You know, everyone is circular. Every piece of description about a criminal. Every record card, report from a penitentiary carries a racial designation. It goes along with hair color, eye color, height, weight, scars, and other marks. And it's considered to be very important information. But is it really very pertinent? Is it important to know race in order to identify a person, to apprehend him? What's its relation to crime? We find white, Italian-American, or Negro. Wouldn't it be better to have skin color? Because it varies. Take this Negro, for example. He's very light-complected. And after all, if you were thinking of an individual Negro, you might think of dark, light, shades of chocolate. This might be a lot more important than the word Negro. Why do we have this sort of thing. Actually, it stems primarily from a notion that's handed down from an idea that many Americans had, that there was an Anglo-Saxon superiority, and strangers coming in were looked at as being potentially evil and criminal and at every time. The American Indian, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Dutch, the Irish, the Jews, the Negroes, the Mexicans. These people at some time have been considered potentially criminal. It's self-explanatory. It indicates a feeling of inferiority for this particular group. Or, another little sign, it's a little more subtle, but it still conveys the notion of racial difference. Here's a couple of papers in which the word Negro is headlined unmercifully, without any reason, and certainly without any advantage if apprehension is what one wants. If we turn on this tape recorder, we have a recording here of what we hear. A dago would kill his father for a few bucks. The only good Indian's a dead Indian. The only good Jap is a dead Jap. All niggers are lazy. Most of them are criminals. Irishmen? Well, they're either cops or gangsters. Either way, they're You thieves. can't trust a Jew. They'll rob you blind. God invented man, but the devil invented German. A Mexican would just as soon kill you as look at you. A Frenchman? He has to have sex, and he doesn't care how he gets it. A Greek? Well, let me... We could let the tape run. It's filled with hundreds of other statements like this. Statements which attribute evil and criminality to boogies and shines to Spicks and Mexicans, to Chinks and Japs. If we take a globe and take a look at some of the racial patterns, we find people that don't like the Germans. They're not a race. They're simply a cultural group. Or we find arguments about race between the people at the Dover Strait, in the English area and in the French area. Now, oddly enough, these people come from essentially the same racial stock. And yet, we find over and over again that people will tell you the Normandy Coast individuals are completely different in their origin from the British. For example, in here we've got a typical one, the symbolic black hand of the Mafia. And here people say, ah, oh, Mafia are Sicilians, Sicilians are criminals. This isn't true. I wonder how many of you, when you think of Sicilians as being a criminal, Ever stop and think of the fact that people outside the country think of Americans as gangsters because Chicago gangsters are as well known in other countries as mafia Sicilians are here. And so we find a very curious thing, the notion that cultures 
cause crime, and when investigated, we find cultures have no relation to crime, but there are criminals in all cultures that may give the culture a bad name, other cultures. What about this racial thing? If we take any book, even the simplest kind, a little pocketbook, we'll find a pretty adequate description of different classifications of race. For example, in here is one from the famous classifier Linnaeus, who classifies Americanus. He adds, that's the American Indian, they're tenacious, Euro Europius, he's lively and inventive, Asiaticus, he's stern and stingy, and Afer, or African, he's cunning, stupid, and negligent. Here, they have taken the Oriental, or Mongol type, and added in, of course, the American Indian as a result of his origin, and some of the Browns. Then, of course, the next classification is the African, or Negro. And finally, the last classification is the Caucasian, or white type. Now, many people, particularly the uninformed, still feel that if you take, for example, a skull of a great ape, and you hold it up alongside a person and look at him, you then try to figure out in what way does he resemble the great ape. And if you can find any resemblances, then you say, well, he looks apish, so he's act, apt, act apish, and in that way he's apt to be more potentially a criminal. Well, as a matter of fact, if you consider this problem, and it's been well done in a book, The Human Animal, by Western Labar, you find a very fascinating discussion. He starts out by defining a typical human as just a person who has two hands, two stereoscopic eyes, two double-arched feet. This is a better description. It doesn't get caught in this problem of skin color. And then he points out the Caucasian may have white skin, blue eyes, and vertical faces, and these are pretty far away from apish types, so may be considered advanced or specialized as opposed to the Negro who is dark-skinned and has a somewhat prognathic or sticking-out jaw. And right away, whites will say that shows that we're further along the evolutionary scale, but if you consider a couple of other factors, for example, the length of the thigh bone and the type of heel, these are two evolutionary characteristics. The longer the bone, the better developed the heel, the more advanced theoretically, away from the ape, we find that these are predominantly characteristics of the Negroes, who have the longest thigh bones and the best developed heels of anybody. And of course, while the Negro does have the dark color of the skin, his hair is curly. And we know that apes, if you've ever looked at apes in a zoo, have long, silky, straight hair. So the Negro actually probably represents the highest evolutionary point from the view of his bones and his hair. And if we take our Mongolian group, our Chinese and Japanese friends, and we look at his nose, which is somewhat saucer-shaped, this, of course, is pretty typical of the animal or apish type, so he isn't very well advanced here. But if we move just a half inch up to his eye, his epicanthal eye fold, this is probably one of the most specialized features. And in this area, he's way ahead of all other humans. Then, of course, if we look at his chest, we find he's essentially hairless. And remember, apes are covered with hair, so the persons who are most hairless essentially are the furthest advanced. There are, of course, a lot of people who simply ignore these scientific findings and will, by offering statistics of a sort, attempt to prove their point. Actually, what they really do is to cheat the statistics by only giving you half of them. For example, here. Here is a set of arrest records from a small Michigan town. The arrests for a day. You look at the names. Zapotaski, Silensky, Wojewicz, Patton, Sinkowitz, Zofia, Anderson, Riley, Cossack. Wisnowski, and so on. Now, you might consider from this set of cards that the Poles commit more crimes than the non-Poles. But as it so happens in this particular little town in Michigan,
The poles fundamentally outnumber the non-poles in a large degree. So really, in parole rate, they probably don't commit as many crimes. You see this all over. These things are not new. They have gone on in history for many, many years. If we go back over the history of this sort of thing, we find, and in this cabinet, we've collected uh, hundreds of examples of the problem of history in relation to this thing. Here, for example, is a cuneiform tablet. And on this cuneiform tablet, written many years before Christ in um, Abyssinia, in uh, <coughs> the cuneiform areas of Mesopotamia, we find a nice description, which is a very deleterious one, of neighboring races. Of course, if you can't read cuneiform, you don't have to worry. You can get yourself a Bible and read some fascinating descriptions of how the Israel tribes didn't like their neighbors. Or you go to ancient Greece. And here, for example, is a nice picture of uh, Aristotle and his pupil, Alexander, discussing a problem which is very common in those days, the problem of the Egyptians as a poor group of people. You know, we have an interesting thing. A couple of bowls of cotton. Probably most people wouldn't relate cotton bowls to racial prejudice. When Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin and found out how to get the seeds out of cotton, then we suddenly found a tremendous demand for slave labor, labor that could be worked day and night, constantly, cheaply. Right away, the Negro was pushed from his status of equality to a status of slave and shackled and leg iron. Of course, the white person had to account for this sudden shift in his treatment. He had to rationalize it. And so, to rationalize it, he simply ascribed to the Negro characteristics of stupidity, laziness, criminality, dirtiness, bad smell, and this then permitted him to treat him in a subhuman way. And if you take a look at the books, you find all sorts of them around the world. For example, here's one, English, Frenchmen, and Spaniards, written by a Spaniard, which isn't very complimentary to the other two. And here's the dandy, the English, are they human? This, of course, was written by a Dutchman. And another one, I think most interesting, published in 1904, a book by a very well-educated Chinese, as a Chinaman saw us, in which the Chinaman com complains bitterly about our body odors, and he also points out he doesn't think we'll ever make it as a culture. It's a comforting thing, I think, for Americans to recognize that there are many other countries which are just as good at slinging slurs as are we in the United States. For example, here's one. Trust a snake before a Jew, a Jew before a Greek, but never trust an Armenian. And here's another one. The Germans gorge and swill themselves to poverty, disease, and hell. Trust a German as you would a dog. And here's the final one, thievish as an American, drunk as a Pole, vindictive as a Corsican, tricky as a Greek. This whole book is a dictionary of such slurs. This brings us to a remote link between race and national origin, or actually the problem in relation of prejudice in relation to crime. To give us some understanding of this background and link, I'd like to have our announcer, Bill Trieste, Describe some pictures we took of typical American scenes. This is a typical street in one area of a major West Coast city. Some people call it Boogie Town. Others call it, more politely, the Negro section. A few call it a disgrace. Here on streets like this live most of the Negroes of the city, locked in by invisible but clearly defined boundaries. Almost every city in America is dotted by such sections, areas populated by people of a particular race or national origin. Segregation of this sort has been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States, but it persists, finding its strength in cultural and economic patterns. The members of the minority groups are helpless. Their fight against segregation has brought few concrete results. Despite the plainly worded decisions of the Supreme Court against discrimination in employment, in voting, in housing, the practice continues. And when they grow to adulthood, that social education isn't broadened. Their employment, their recreation, even their everyday chores such as shopping, 
are marked by varying kinds of discrimination. Invisible, perhaps, but ever present. This picture shows a very important thing. While race has no direct relation to criminal behavior, sometimes in a sort of second-hand way, it does. And this is because the majority very frequently oppress the minority. They keep them in a straight-jacketed groove, and sometimes the minority person overcompensates and flares back and commits a crime. And so we get a second-hand kind of crime. A result not of the basic race or nationality, but a result of the bigoted, narrow-minded treatment of the minority by the majority. And then second, of course, if an individual from one culture has a different pattern of behavior, frequently this is called criminal by the other majority culture. Something important can be done this way to do away with crime by doing away with prejudice. And one simple start might be, for example, to reorganize wanted cards by the simple process of scratching out the place where it says race and putting in the blood type, A, B, or O. This idea was suggested by Boyd in his book, Genetics and the Races of Man. And Boyd's basic point was that the important thing, if you must have racial separation technically, is to use blood types because they can only be told in the laboratory. They can't be told by looking. This would do away with the idea of skin color. It would do away with the idea of saying he's different. So he's inferior, so he must be a criminal. There's no relation between race and criminality, and there's no relation between culture and criminality. And if we use blood types, types we can't see to indicate this sort of thing, then we would be able to do away with the fundamental idea of differences in people, differences in criminality as a result of racial differences. We would be able to recognize the fact you can't tell by looking.